sorry, buddy. She does. I'll just leave up here. Dave uh, evidently wrote a couple papers and left them here, so instead of using the service time to pass them out, if you want them, they're up here. sermon. I'm, you know, by trade, I am a writer. I'm not a speaker. I do speak from time to time when I go to campus, but typically it's not to a captive audience. It's to a, a hostile audience for the most part. You know, people don't want to hear what I say. So that I come to a, a venue like this and you all look at me expectantly like I have some great nuggets of truth, I always get just a little bit intimidated. And that's partly because I don't believe that I have any more truth than most of you. You read your Bibles, you pray, you ask questions, you seek answers, and I'm just like the rest of you. You know, I'm not a theologian, I'm a simple man, a simple job, and so... I want to say, I don't on. think you give yourself enough credit. Amen. You are very good. Well, whether that's the case or not, <laughs> I am not a speaker. I am just not a public speaker, so you'll have to bear with me. I might get stuck from time to time. Um, I remember when I was in college, every once in a while, because I was an education major, you took these methods classes. It was methodology of teaching, basically, and it was how you were supposed to teach. So we would eventually have to give speeches in front of our classmates, or we'd have to give talks about things. And the way I used to give speeches is that I would, I would memorize the whole speech, if it were a 10 minute speech, I'd have to memorize 10 minutes worth of text. So I would stay up at night just reading it over and over again so that it would become kind of in the back of my mind. The problem was, inevitably, I would look out into the audience and something would make my brain just kind of go sideways for a moment and I'd get lost. And then I'd just start to ramble. I would love to have some of the video of me speaking at some of these classes when I was in college. It must have just been hilarious. But I'll try not to be that disorganized. But as I mentioned earlier, if you have comments, I love comments. I don't like just for me to give it to you while you just sit there and soak it in. I like to hear from you too. So during the course of this sermon, please pipe up comments. <laughs> Jean, John, anybody else, you women are, are welcome too as well. But I did um, have some thoughts, and, and that's because I do look at the world around me, and I look at the state of affairs, and I think there's something wrong with the way things are in the world today. I think there's a famous song about that there's something wrong in the world today. And I can't help but think that that's not the way that God intended for us to be living right now. We see the chaos, we see the violence, we see the sexual promiscuity, the, you know, the tending toward drugs and alcohol and all these things that are trying, people are trying to um, do to make themselves feel better or to feel better about themselves or about their situations. And I think, well, what is the remedy to this? What is the remedy to what's happening in the world today? And I think we all know the answer to that. It is Christianity. But Christianity doesn't exist all by itself. It exists in you and me. Christianity, as Dave says, we bring Christ when we come to church. Christianity isn't just this thing that envelopes the world. It is us. And so we are, 
Christ's ambassadors, we are his emissaries, we are his spokespeople here on this earth. And if there's a problem, the fix is Christ. But that can't be fixed unless we, um, we promote Christ, unless we preach Christ, unless we live Christ, unless we become the examples for the world to see. And I think what's happened is um, we have failed somewhat in that endeavor. And I'm not saying we've failed as individuals. I'm saying it's possible that the church has mm -hmm. failed. The church definitely has some issues. And so my sermon today is, what is church? Because I think defining our terms, defining what we mean by things, is very important today. In fact, in any debate, if you learn debate or you learn speech, you learn that defining your terms is very important. If two people are talking about one topic, but they both have different definitions of what that topic is, it's like two pass ships passing in the night. They never meet. You have to have the terms understood by both sides to make sense of an argument. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I would like to define what is church. Of course, we've been doing church. That's what we're here for today, right? And church kind of looks the same from one Sunday to the next, doesn't it? I mean, we basically come, we socialize for a little bit, we sing a couple songs, and then somebody gets up here and we talk. Um, but I often wonder if that's how the early church was, and if that's how church was meant to be. I'm not necessarily trying to take issue with how we do it, but I don't think it's, it's harmful to ask ourselves, are we doing it right, and are we doing it in a manner that's being effective? Because what is the, the duty of the church? Can somebody tell me what they believe the duty of the church is? I mean, it has more than one duty. But let's just brainstorm a little bit. What are some of the duties of the church? Promote Christ. Yeah, educate on Christianity, Christ, who Christ is. Right. Promote fellowship. Yeah. Yeah. In the early days, they would bring all the stuff into the storehouses, like charity. Yeah, that's right. They did. Mm -hmm. They all had things in common. What were you going to say, Joyce? No, I, I was pointing to John because you didn't hear him. No, I heard John. I also think it's a place where we come to grow in grace and equip each other yeah. in iron sharpens iron to continue to, you know, encourage each other to keep enduring in the faith and keep going out there and just being a light and, and encouragement in that way. Yeah, that is true. The Bible says it is for the equipping of the saints, mm -hmm. correct? But why do we need to be equipped? one in the world. Yeah, exactly. Church should never be what I call it a sort of an in-feeding or in-sourcing entity alone where it's just about us. Mm -hmm. right? Christianity cannot be just about those of us who are in here. There is a component to that. There's no question about that. We are to encourage one another in the faith. We're to grow in grace. We're to learn. We're to you know, to be a body of believers, as Brian said, at one point, they had everything in common. They sold what they had and they brought it and laid it at the apostles' feet and the apostles distributed it as was needed. And they made sure that the elders in the church were taken care of. They made sure that the widows were taken care of and the orphans were taken care of. So the church has multiple um, responsibilities. But I think the one that we have failed to really take uh, hold of and to run with is what Gene was saying. We need to be prepared, we need to be equipped to take this message of salvation out into the world. And I think that's evident in the statistics that you read today, and I have a couple of those right here, about the state of the church. Do you know that in 1970, that was 10 years after I was born, can somebody guess what the percentage of Christianity was in America? of those people who would call or consider themselves Christian? Probably 40%. In 1970. Oh, that isn't even close. Oh, really? 70, 80%? 90%. 90%. 90% in 1970 considered themselves Christian. Now you have to remember, in the 1970s, there was a, what I consider a pretty great revival. Would you, Gene, c yeah. conclude yeah, that I same mean. thing? Lots of you weren't around in the 70s, you youngsters, but in 1970, I was 10 years old, and that's when the charismatic movement began. That, has anybody heard about this movie, uh, The Jesus Revolution? Mm -hmm. It's in the theaters, or was um, earlier in the spring. It was all about that time period where 
there seemed to be a, a move of Christianity among the hippies first, but it spread. And I remember as a, as a young teenager how many of my friends became Christian and how their parents became Christians. And whole towns really took on this really Christian um, atmosphere. So it did kind of sweep the nation. I don't know if it was considered a legitimate revival by everybody, but I would say from my experience that there was certainly a revival in the early 70s. You had people like David Wilkerson, Keith Green, you had these um, <clears throat> names who uh, really promoted Christ. They were um, artists, they were great <coughs> preachers. Uh, David Wilkerson, have you ever read the book The Cross and the Switchblade or Run Baby Run by David Wilkerson? Yeah. These things were in everybody's homes in the 1970s. Rebel um, with the cause? Mm -hmm. um, that was That's James Dean. <laughs> Graham. What's that? Billy Graham's son. Rebel Franklin. with a cause. What was it called? Rebel with a cause. With a cause. With a cause. Without a cause is, without is Gene oh. Dean. Okay. Very good book. Really? And was that back in that time period or was that mm. later on in his life? I'm not sure what time period. Because I know he had some struggles with drugs and other things. Oh, he? yes. Yeah. Well, anyway, the church really rose up in those days, and so that's why I can believe that in, in 1970 that the, the polls show that 90% of Americans consider them Christian, or consider themselves Christians. Do you know what that number is today? Very low. About 20%. Um, well, actually, it's 64% that call themselves Christians. Now, of course, Lots of people call themselves Christians mm -hmm. today, right? Who aren't what we would necessarily call Christian. Mm -hmm. By the way, what does what does the word Christian mean? Christ -like. Yeah, it means little Christians. It was a term first coined at the, in Antioch. And I use I used to have a sign that I would take out onto college campuses, um, basically asking people. Um, to define what they mean by Christian, because I would say things like, you can't be a Christian and vote for Joe Biden, you can't be a Christian and vote for pro-choice Democrats. And a lot of times people would say, well, I'm a Christian. And I would ask them, well, what do you mean by a Christian? Because my definition of Christian, of course, was much different than theirs. And so again, I had to define my terms. What do I mean by a Christian? To me, a Christian is one who follows Christ, one who follows the dictates of Christ, not only follows them, but <coughs> preaches and promotes them. And obeys them. And what? And obeys them. And obeys them, exactly. Now, can you be a follower of Christ? Can you be a little Christ and promote those things that Christ hated or that Christ said were taboo or were unacceptable? Mm -hmm. Can you reconcile the two? Can you say, I can be a Christian and be a pro abort Democrat at the same time? No. No. no, not in my mind. No. Um, but again, that's why as we debate these topics, as we engage the world, we need to make sure that we are defining our terms correctly. As you said, people say they're Christians but in their own mind. But just to go sit in a church, you're not a Christian. No, you've got to go there and you've got to know Christ and serve Christ and obey Christ. Right. But people just go because they think they go to church. I'm going to heaven, and right. I'm a Christian, and their life does not show that. Yeah, that's true. Well, a couple verses that come to mind is it even talks about that Jesus said, if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of mine. Amen. Right. And then also in Titus 1.16, I always use, so many people profess to know God, but deny me by their works, being despicable and disobedient, worth nothing. Just to say that you love God doesn't mean anything. Right. It's about the way you live and the way you are a light in, in, in obeying Him. Exactly. Exactly. Well, one more quick statistic, and I believe that is that among millennials, only 50% or 56% believe they're Christian. And I think that's probably your group, right, Kristen? Mm -hmm. We talked about this the other day. Sarah's group, probably. That's Sarah's group? What are you guys? We're Gen Z's. Gen Z's. <laughs> yeah. I don't have. Let's see. Gen X is 32 percent. Gen I'm Z is 36 percent considered themselves Christian. Where am I? I don't know. <laughs> I'm 40, You're so I'm aware of that. So <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously, the statistics are moving in the wrong direction. And here's the great tragedy about that. As millennials, 
have children and they stop going to church, they stop taking their children to church. And those children, when they grow up, stop taking their children to church. And before long, what you have is you have an unchurched population that doesn't even know the dictates of the religion that some of them espouse to know. And that's what's tragic. Our country was founded upon Christian principles, some things that we just kind of took for granted. Honesty. Um, you know, some of the things that, you know, the, the declarations of independence and the Constitution hold to be true. Um, those things are rooted in Christian principles. And without Christianity, those things wouldn't be as um, applicable. And so as we forget our religion, mm -hmm. and we forget our heritage, our Christian heritage, even our civic heritage, I don't know, do they teach civics in school anymore? I don't even know. Like, in like government, do they teach those things anymore? Do they teach constitution in high school? Do they? Okay. But as we lose sight of our foundations and our beginnings, it's very hard for us to move forward. We're only going to be moving backwards, and that's what I think society shows that's happening. There's a, an important verse in Matthew that deals with the church, and it's when Jesus asks Peter, who do the people say that I am? And then he asks, or he asks all the disciples that question, but finally he asks Peter, who do you say that I am? And what does Peter say? Oh, Lord, the Christ, the Son of the Living God. And what does Jesus say immediately after that? He says, "Flesh and blood is not revealed unto you, but my Father in heaven." Right. And then he says, "Upon this rock, I will build my church." This rock is not Peter, as the Catholics no. like to think. The rock is the truth that Jesus is the Christ, right. and Christ is the Messiah. Now, if we look at that verse, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us, I think people have a misconception of what that means sometimes. We think that we're behind the gate, and yeah. Satan's attacking us, right? We're in a defensive posture. Isn't that how a lot of people think about that verse? The gates of hell shall not prevail against us. It means God's protecting us from Satan, from hell. But the reality is gates don't attack people. Gates serve Two functions. What are they? Entrance and exit. Exactly. They're either to keep something out or to keep something in. In terms of this verse, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, Christ. It means that it's trying to keep us out and it's trying to keep others in, correct? Those, the Bible says, that have been slaves to sin, those who are... I think the verse says, uh, held captive to do his will. There are people who are held captive by Satan to do his will. And I think it's implied, even though it's not explicitly stated, that the church is the group that is assailing or assaulting the gates of hell. Right. I mean, what else can that mean, if not that? It doesn't mean we're in, Lord, beam me up, get me out of this mess mode. Mm -hmm. It means we're on the attack. The gates of hell shall not prevail. In some verses, I think, will not withstand the church as assault on it. Well, let me ask you, do we really see the church assaulting the gates of hell? Mm -hmm. Not at all. What would that look like we're if the church hell. were assaulting the gates of out of control. I mean, it just like, it wouldn't be, I don't think that's what we're supposed to be doing. What? What's that? Assaulting the gates of hell. Really? Well, it, it, it's in, well, it's we in do, yeah, we can, this. but I mean, we have to make sure that we in God's will when we do that, though. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, I, I'm not saying, you know, that we pick up guns and rifles <laughs> and we yeah. go after the wicked. I don't think that's what Christ yeah. was saying at all. I think what he was saying is our truth is going to run headlong into some other truths. And ours will win. But in order to win, what has to happen? We have to engage. You don't win a battle by staying home. You don't win a battle by doing nothing. The only way you win the battle or you storm the gates of hell is by marching against it. And I think that is one of the things that, as a church, not just our church, but I'm, I'm talking the church in general. 
We need to get busy because the gates of hell seem to be pressing in on us rather than the other way around. John, you were going to say something? It's what I would call constant vigilance. Yeah. Well, what the church is doing is now they're just become just accepting of everybody mm -hmm. and accepting of the way they live and accepting sin and that we're just forgiven and that Jesus' righteousness is accounted to us. So there's just no, there's not preaching of holiness. There's not preaching of grieving the heart of God. None of that is being preached. And when that's not being preached, you can't go out there and stand against it. They're actually friends of the world. They're, they're no different. Yeah. And they're even enemies of God, and, and, and they're, so that's just what's, it, it, it's difficult. Yeah. The Bible says this, the Bible says, The righteous are as bold as a lion, mm -hmm. but the wicked flee when no man pursues it. If you're wicked, you're not going to take a stand for righteousness. Right? You just can't, because you in your own mind know you're a hypocrite. And most likely that's going to be borne out somehow, and it's going to expose you for the, the person that you are. But the righteous... The Bible says, bold as a lion. Well, I think that that's one of the things that we as Christians need to take into account. Amen. We want and we need to pursue that righteousness, not just for righteousness' sake alone, mm -hmm. because that's just, you know, that's good for us. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> as Christians, we're not to be so myopic. We're not to be so inward-looking where we're concerned only with what's happening with us. You know, am I going to make it? I, I don't often mention this. I have a friend named Adrian, and he has this Adrian famous, Adrian you know. Morian. He has this you know. famous sermon called "A Dog in a Fight Doesn't Know He Has Fleas." I love the title. A dog in a fight doesn't know he has fleas. See, a lot of times in churches, we spend a lot of time swatting the fleas, and I think that's because. We're not in the battle. We're not in the fight. When you have big things that you are fighting against, when you see things that you need to attend to, when you're in the business of saving souls and reaching the lost, the little things that sometimes so preoccupy us, they just kind of don't matter anymore. So if you're in the fight, if you're in the battle, you won't be that concerned about those things. Now that doesn't mean you're not concerned about sin. I don't think those fleas are sin. I think those are some of the things that a lot of times we just get preoccupied with. Um, I don't know that I can explain what they are, but I know this. I know when you're in the battle, you prepare yourself for the battle, not just for your own sake and, and for making it, you know, by the skin of your teeth, but so that you can help others into that kingdom. And I also think that one of the things that I struggled the first time around when I was pursuing and following God was there needs to be a good balance because when I dig into the Word, I'm trying to feed myself, but at the same time, I'm also trying to equip myself and understand the Scriptures in the sense that I can reach my brother. Where I think sometimes people want to win an argument versus really trying to gain your brother. So it's trying to find that wisdom in the sense of, Yes, I'm in the Word not just to win an argument. I'm not in the Word just to prove and puff up my chest that I'm this theologian. It's, no, this is who God is, and this is what, in, in my walk with the Lord and growing in grace, but then it's allowing me to have the wisdom and how to reach the lost and have those conversations and be a representation of Christ. Because I think a lot of times people will study because they want to win an argument. No, that, that's really good. Yeah, the, the whole point is to win your brother. That's important. I saw this interview by this young woman who was part of the swimming team. They, were, they had a, a few winners that should have been winners. But then this transgender, I think her, his name was Leah or something. Leah Thomas. And, yeah, Leah Thomas. And anyway, they, the women, young girls that were Young women, I guess. Uh, anyway, the ones that were, they were sort of shocked that <laughs> here's this transgender, a foot taller than most of them, and wanted to be part of the team, and they were all uncomfortable with that. And yet, it was promoted by their trainer and so on, so they didn't know what exactly to do. Some of, I mean, in general, she said most of the women on that team were uncomfortable with that decision. 
But then she said, well, I'm a good Catholic, and so, you know, she was supposed to love others, etc. And she didn't know exactly what to do, but in the end, they ended up accepting even though. And then, of course, um, as far as, <clears throat> of course, he was allowed to come into the locker room and so on, and she said, well, we would change as quickly as possible, but none of us felt comfortable like that. So it just shows, in general, these young women, etc., they're when they're introduced to something like they don't like it, but yet it goes on, and so um, they really don't know how to handle it because they're it's something relatively quite new, and they're sort of shocked about what's well, going part, on. Part of it is in one of the things that you said. You know, we don't define our terms very well. Love. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a a lot. There are a lot of people who believe that love is synonymous with yeah. acceptance. Mm -hmm. And it isn't necessarily so. That's true. I mean, as a father, I might love my son, but I don't necessarily accept him hitting his sister. I don't tolerate that. So, you know, we've bandied about certain words in our culture like intolerance. Well, that's the worst thing in the world. Yet, God's intolerant. He's intolerant of sin. He's intolerant of baby murder. He's intolerant of sexual immorality. And if we're going to be God-like, if we're going to be Christ-like, we have to, and I know that people don't like this word, but we have to hate what God hates, and we have to love what God loves. I mean, that's being a Christian. And so again, we have defined love other than how the Bible defines it. And if I define love, it's, it's you know, willing the best for my neighbor. And willing the best for my neighbor is not approving of sin that's ultimately going to send them to hell. Can I, can I read this quote by Michael Wolf about love? That sure. goes along the lines of what you're saying. He says, uh, love is often mistakenly thought of in terms of a sentimental, emotional reaction or an all-accepting tolerance and warm embrace. Surely love must be something other than a pleasant emotion, warm, fuzzy feelings. As love can produce anger. If someone you love is being abused or mistreated, it is love that produces anger and resistance regarding such abuse. Whether we are considering the concept of warm feelings or a response of anger, the emotion itself is not love. Emotional response can be seen as a particular manifestation produced by love, but must not be mistaken for love itself. Yeah, that's good. But if you ask your typical millennial, Gen Z or Gen X or whatever they happen to be, what love is, in a lot of cases what you will find, and I find this because I am on campus talking with these groups all the time, I find that love is just an emotion. It's a feeling that they have. Mm -hmm. And so, when I, and I'll do that. I'll ask the question, well, how do you define love? And so I get those answers. And then when I define love as Michael Wolf defined it, or as I define it, and that is willing the best for my neighbor, it's astonishing how new that idea is to them. Mm -hmm. That love is more than just a feeling. It is an action. Mm -hmm. It requires action. Even if that action is just willing something, that is still considered an action. But God loves us, not just He has a sentimental feeling about Him, but He bestows His blessings upon us. He loves us in that way, and that, I think, is a, is a way that we show our love to our neighbor by bestowing <laughs> blessings upon them. And a blessing sometimes, and the Bible says this, open rebuke is better than secret love. Sometimes love is a rebuke. Sometimes love is a correction. Sometimes love is a hard word. Should be. Especially when, as you said before, the attempt is to win your brother. Mm -hmm. And it isn't always just winning your brother. Sometimes it is winning the point for this, for this reason. Because in this world, there is so much theology out there, there are so many isms, there are so many different ways of thinking about things. We have to be correct sometimes in the points that we make because other people are going to use those in their arguments mm -hmm. to win their brother. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very studious sometimes mm -hmm. in how we um, arrange our arguments, how we define our terms so that we can be these effective evangelists because we don't want to just be people out there who are speaking to the wind just blowing our words out there so that maybe someone will hear them. Um, we have to be efficacious. I think that's a word that Charles Finney used quite often. We have to be effective in our ministry. Our, our attempt 
is to win the loss. And that requires that we study, that we stay in the Word, that we pray, and that we love our brother. We have to actually love them. We can't just say, I love this idea about being a Christian. I love this idea about being an evangelist. I love this idea about being a street preacher. We have to actually love our neighbor enough to tell them the truth. And Paul says that. You know, we have a whole chapter in 1 Corinthians. That it's called the love chapter. Mm -hmm. okay, let me just read that for you. Because I think, um, I mean, it's just a great chapter. And it, it, it's a cautionary chapter about how we should love. And here's what it says. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. That means if you're out evangelizing, you're doing anything that isn't rooted and motivated by love, mm -hmm. you're nothing but noise. Mm -hmm. And there are people out there who are doing that. I've met street preachers who I'm barely convinced love the idea of being a street preacher, but I can't tell you for sure that they actually love the people that they're preaching to because mm -hmm. of some of the things that I've heard and some of the attitudes that I've seen. So love has to be the foundation upon which we build our evangelical endeavors. It goes on. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. What that tells me is that we can try to accumulate and acquire a lot of knowledge too. Mm -hmm. um, try to be a, a um, mighty thinker in terms of Christianity. But without love, even that is fruitless. Even that is pointless. We are nothing. So love has to undergird even that, our understanding of the scriptures and our ability to articulate those. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people today who believe in philanthropic efforts. I see them all the time. Not all the time are they done for love. Some people do it because it makes them feel good. Mm -hmm. I'll always remember this quote, I think it was Jerry Lewis, when he was asked why he he does the, the MDA telethon. That is Jerry Lewis, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. What did he say? He said, I do it because it makes me feel good. <coughs> now, I don't doubt that there is some altruistic thinking on his part, too. He does do it for the people that he's helping. But that's the wrong reason mm -hmm. to be in philanthropy, mm -hmm. because it makes you feel good. But I know that that's a fact. And I know that some people do it because it gives them a badge. It gives them some notoriety in their community. Some people do it for political gain. Mm -hmm. But without love, it is nothing. It gains nothing. And here's what it says about love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. Mm -hmm. So, when I read passages like this, I think love is really the foundation and should be the foundation of our lives. Mm -hmm. We can get confused sometimes and think theology is, doctrine is, not poking fun at me. <clears throat> doctrine is important, theology is important because it helps us to live in accordance with how, we, how God intends us to live. But without love, it's all meaningless. And I think love is one of those things that needs to be infused back into the Christian church. For sure. John. Um, I mean, my normal reaction when I see all these, like our chief of staff of all our services, he's more concerned about these transgender feelings. He was interviewed on more than, he was, had a house hearing. And, you know, that comes out, he says, well, I don't promote her, and so on. But yet, he has this, these drag queens on bases, and, you know, that he's concerned about them more than the regular people. And, I mean, my immediate reaction is anger, so am I sinning when I... No, um, the Bible does say anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. But there is righteous anger. There is righteous indignation. The Bible says, be angry, but sin not. So it actually tells us to be angry. And there are things worth being angry about. I'm angry that we parade these grown men with beards and pot bellies in women's underwear in front of elementary school children. I'm angry about that. I think we should all be angry about that. And I think that's why 
That's part of storming the gates of hell. Mm -hmm. That's when they have the the uh, drag queen, queen queen story hour down at the Rockford Library. We need to mobilize. We ought to be angry. We ought to not just be the most peaceful about it. We should say this is wrong in no uncertain terms. A stiff answer, uh, open rebuke, is the kind of love that the world needs in, in situations like that. But yeah, we should be angry about that. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with being angry when we look at the people that we've elected to government office promoting policies that affect the little children that live down the street from me. You know, the neighbors across the street, they've got two little kids. They fly up a gay pride yeah. flag they have in the past. And I know that that's because of indoctrination. They're a young couple. They probably have never lived in an era where gay rights wasn't promoted when LGBTQ weren't the five most mm -hmm. wonderful words, words in the English alphabet. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to recognize that the group of people that we are preaching to today, that we are ministering to today, that we are evangelizing today, I say this because I'm old, and I know a lot of us are about my age, but they're a lot different than the people we grew up in. In 1976, queer was a derogatory term. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a term of infection, of affection. It wasn't a term of endearment. But today, they call themselves queer. Mm -hmm. We're queer, we're here, we're proud of it. So we deal today with a whole different set of variables than we did back in the 1970s when 90% of people said they were Christian. The reason there's only 56% now is I think partly because we don't understand the audience that we're, we're preaching to. And so one of my, my encouragements is that we need to do a little self-inspection. We need to examine ourselves. We need to examine what it is we're doing. Not necessarily saying this on a personal level, but as a church. Are we being effective ministers of the gospel? If the church's implicit objective is to storm the gates of hell, and I believe that it is. I think by that statement that they sh the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. I think we need to do that. That needs to become our job. It isn't something that we can say, well, that's up to somebody else. We can't consign our responsibility to evangelize the world to politicians who are going to vote on these things. We have to be the feet. We have to be the voice. We have to be the emissaries, the ambassadors of Christ that he expects us to be. And that's to be the face of God in this world in which we live, which is lost. It's in chaos right now. I mean, you may disagree with that. I don't know. I'm open to that. These are the conclusions that I come to when I look out and I survey the land around me and I see what's around me when I go to college campuses and I see what kids are believing today, what they understand to be morality, what they understand love to be, what they understand to be acceptance and tolerance and all these other things, what they are, I see that they don't understand as we understand it as Christians, Bible-believing Christians. Um, so we have to do something about that. I think things that can be sometimes difficult is when it talks about judging and judgment. It needs to come from a righteous place. And I think too many people are not looking at themselves and reflecting on their own actions and hearts towards the way they love God. Because I think a lot of times that maybe there isn't as much charging the gates as there should be is because I think like a lot of people, like, I just think in the sense of, I don't know where I was trying to go with this, it's just in the sense of, People that are not living right themselves shouldn't be in a position of judging somebody else. Mm -hmm. And my point is, is I think most people that profess to love God are not even in a place that they should be judging because they got the log in their own eye. And that's where one of those things where I think we must be careful too in charging the gates is doing it from a righteous place in, in the sense of that it's coming from a pure motive. It's coming from... I just think we need we also need to be careful of that because I can see people storming the gates and judging, yet they have sin in their own life that they're not reflecting on, and it's it's just that 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 balance. And no, no, I I get that. I mean, you're basically quoting Matthew seven two, but remember, 
Here's what Matthew 7, 2 says. It says, Judge not lest you be judged. For in the manner you judge, you will be judged. Oh, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but fail to notice the log in your own? It says, you hypocrite, first remove the log from your own eye, so you'll be able to clearly see the speck in your brother's eye. Now, we say, okay, well, that's an admonition to judge. But not just for judgment's sake. We're to see the speck in our brother's eye for what purpose? So we can pull it out. When my children had a speck in their eye. We got a Kleenex and we pulled it out. We didn't just judge it. We want that person to see clearly too. So you're right. Our motive always have, has to be, as you said earlier, reconciliation. Um, making sure our brother is reconciled to his creator. But I don't think we can lose sight of the fact either, though, that the Bible talks about putting on the whole armor of God. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the armor of God, it is all offensive in nature. Mm -hmm. You don't have a back plate, you have a breastplate. Right. You have a helmet, and you have a sword. We have things that we're supposed to use to employ in this storming the gates of hell. Now I know that that's kind of a bombastic statement. Storming the gates of hell, you know, you, you conjure up pictures of people with pitchforks and, and you know, flames on the end of sticks, you know. <laughs> You know, the old Frankenstein movie, basically. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm saying. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying there is a time for action. And we don't want to be rabid about it. We don't want to... We have to always be careful that when people see us in the world and they know that we're Christian, they're comparing us mm -hmm. with Christianity. Mm -hmm. And they're saying... With their one of, version of Christianity. Yeah. But they're saying one of two things. They're saying either, you're not a very good Christian, you're not a very good representative of Christian Christianity, or the alternative is, you're a very good representative of Christianity. Christianity sucks. I mean, those are the two conclusions that people derive. If you're not doing what you should be doing, people are either saying, you're breaking with your Christianity, or that's what Christianity really is. Either case, it's bad. So like you said, we need to remove the log from our eye so that we can see clearly to remove the speck from our brother's eye so that we can enable them to reconcile with God. Again, love has to be the foundation of that. If love isn't the foundation, then you are just a, a mm -hmm. clinging symbol. If you're just removing speck from people's eyes just because you like to remove speck from people's eyes, it doesn't necessarily mean love, does it? It doesn't. It can be just works. I struggle right now with, because all of it comes back to discerning who your audience is to, and you nailed it on the head with terminology, yep, because terms. I'll speak to another so-called brother who has their cafeteria Christianity and what a Christian is and how they're supposed to live, and then I'll talk to a family member or a friend who is not a believer and I can actually understand why they're not a believer because of their definition of who God is. Sure. And what I, in particular with the LBGTQ community, this is the first time I've ever posted on it because I knew that I would offend people who I love and it hurts. Yeah. And I want to reach my friends and family, but you do have to discern who you're talking to. And I don't expect them to understand that what I'm saying is loving. I don't expect them to get it. And I also can't cram it down their throat. I can't make them understand who God is. So sometimes the most loving thing I can do after making a statement is leave them alone. And just let them have their thoughts. Because no matter how much I try to explain to them that this is loving, mm -hmm. That their rebellion in the LBGTQ community is no different than your own rebellion outside of marriage or even within your marriage. It's right. all rebellion. Right. And I, I, we're just, there's just not a month of pride for your rebellion. There's a month of pride for this rebellion. So I'm supporting God by opposing it. And I cannot expect them to understand that. And, I, and the Bible does talk about that, that you know they didn't know him, so they're not going to know me because I'm a reflection of him. And so sometimes it is about discerning, and the best way to storm the gates of hell is to leave it alone, to say your peace, and just continue living in right relationship with God and letting them see you be a reflection of Him in your day-to-day -day life. Right. Yeah, consistency. Well mm -hmm. yeah, very well said.
Um, not every child who is spanked by his father understands what, what's happening. And they don't like it. And they may not think you're loving. But it is the loving thing to do. And whether they agree, whether they submit to that, whether they believe that you're being loving, the reality is you do it because you are loving. And sometimes that's the only consolation you get, is that you do love them, and you love them enough to tell them the truth. They may never understand. They may call you a homophobe. They may call you names for the year to the day that they die. They may. You can't control that. And you can't also not tell the truth because you're afraid of the rejection. The Bible is very clear. All who will live God in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You're going to be rejected. Jesus told us that. Even by your own family. They're going to deliver you up to the courts, the Bible says. Your own family members will. And I think one of the most important things that she said, though, is is you have to be a light. You have to be a representation because this is what gives Christianity such a bad name. Is you have people that are saying and claiming things, yet they're drinking and getting drunk, and then comes out they're having affairs. It's one of those things where it has to be from a place of of being a reflection and and. They're, they're watching us. They're, they're, they, it's like I actually find it an honor if somebody's got a bullseye on my, on my back or my chest because I want them watching my life. I want them watching how I respond to people on Facebook. I want them to watch every single part of my life, even in secret, because there are no secrets with God. And that's just where I think that's the nail on the head is what's going to speak volumes to somebody is, yes, the word is sharper than a two-edged sword, but it's the way that we reflect Christ as well. It has to be together. Yeah, we can't we can't forget about appearance. We can't forget about the fact that the world is watching and they're taking stock and they're trying to find reasons why not to serve this Christ. We don't want to be the reason. The Bible talks about that. Let's not give the nations a reason to blaspheme. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sum it up with just reading a song that we've sung before. It's, it's a hymn by Fanny Crosby, but I think this kind of, how do I put this? This has the sentiments, I think, that I want to convey as evangelists and encouraging you to be evangelical and to be lights as you storm the gates of hell. And again, that's a very bombastic term, so try not to get that picture. Maybe I chose that poorly, storming the gates of hell. Um, I don't want you to think we just go barrels blazing, no thought beforehand, don't care what we look like. I don't want you to get that impression at all. Here's the impression I want to leave you with. This is from her song, Rescue the Perishing. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep o'er the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter. We have to remember that. There are people, the Bible says, who are held captive by Satan to do his will. We need to rescue them. Feelings like buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness. Chords that were broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor, the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. This presents a picture of the sinner a little bit more, the, how do I want to put it, deplore, that's not the word I'm, I'm looking for. We have a tendency to look at sinners as just the worst that mankind has to offer. Untouchables. Let's stay away from them. Let's keep them over there, and let's keep us over here. I think we need to change our thinking about that. They are worth winning to Christ. They are worth winning. We're to have pity on them. We're not just to excoriate them. We're not just to say, we're separate. We're to be separate from their deeds. We're not to be like them. But we want to take the speck out of their eye. We want to be the people who want to take the speck out of their eyes so that they can be reconciled to the Savior. I think that's the message of the Gospel. I think it's not a sanitized, 
It's just the doctrinal position we take. You either accept it or you don't. There are human beings who have needs, who love, who have the same emotions and the experiences that we have. We need to empathize with them so that we can win them. We need to win them. That's what it's about. In the end, that's what's going to matter. Whether that person that we know has heard the truth and has made a commitment to live that truth. All the other things, even the sins that they commit, we don't want to get so hung up on them. We want to get hung up on the person, on the person that we're trying to reach. Well, I hope that that's um, helped you some. It's one of those things that I've been thinking about lately, especially, like I said, because I look at the world around me and I see it kind of in the state of chaos that it is. It needs a savior. <laughs> we are the spokespeople for that savior. Jesus isn't going to come down here until he comes again for the second time, and then it will be too late when he comes to judge the living and dead. So let's be the evangelist that Christ called us to be in love. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's it. Okay. That's all I have. Okay.